I am delighted to be here today to introduce our speaker, visiting professor of English, Kelly McMasters. Um, as you know, Common Hour is a time when the Franklin and Marshall community convenes to receive word from a person whose experience and accomplishments have had a profound effect on the world, and from whom we know we can expect wisdom, insight, perspective, and also sometimes challenge and controversy. Usually we import these special speakers to Lancaster. And this makes sense given how easy it is for the recognized experts, the Nobel Prize winners, the uh, world-renowned um, scientists, and uh, highly accomplished artists to just jump on a plane and come our way. But there are also times, and today is one of them, when we turn to a member of our own community and ask this person of substance and accomplishment to speak about their experience and their success. It is especially fitting that our local guest today is Kelly McMasters. As I said, she's a visiting professor of English. She's also a highly acclaimed writer of literary nonfiction, a very experienced teacher of undergraduate and graduate students, and a nationally recognized activist. Kelly's work is an example in every way of how people close to us, our local community, individuals who we might think of as fairly ordinary, um, are capable of great things and in need of being attended to. Welcome to Shirley, a memoir from an atomic town is Kelly's story about her blue-collar hometown of Shirley, Long Island, a place, as she says, full of strong, hard-working families and an abundance of natural beauty that would be devastated by the environmental catastrophe of a nearby leaking nuclear laboratory. I like to think of it as equal parts detective story and first-person recollection. This book reveals the terrible effects of government neglect on working class communities, not only on Long Island, but also across the country. As a journalist, McMasters writes with precision, affection, and venom about the history of her hometown, says Donna Seaman of Booklist. Joining the growing circle of environmental health memoirists, McMarshall, McMarsh, McMasters Marshalls, excuse me, the facts, and articulates feelings with eloquence and drama telling stories of personal suffering to expose crimes against the public and against nature itself. Welcome to Shirley was listed as one of Oprah's top five summer memoirs and is also the basis of a documentary film, The Atomic States of America, which was a 2012 Sundance selection. Kelly McMasters is also a very accomplished naturalist and her essays, reviews, and articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post Magazine, the Paris Review, the American Scholar, River Teeth, a journal of narrative nonfiction, Tin House, Newsday, and Columbia Magazine. Most recently, Kelly published a year's worth of essays on the Eidolon Paris Review about her experiences founding and running an independent bookstore called Moody Road Studios in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. This was a kind of frontier experience in which she combated the e-commerce industry literally one reader at a time. Virtuously modest and insanely ambitious in equal measure, Kelly succeeds in her work in showing all of us how, can we, how we can act singly and locally to change the world. Please welcome Kelly McMasters. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you to the English department and to the campus um, overall for welcoming me. Um, this is my second semester, and since arriving here, I've just been amazed over and over again by the way this campus is able and interested in coming together as a community with Common Hour, the most enduring and alive example of this. Um, 
The Writer's House is another beautiful example where writers can come together and non-writers, people who are readers, and join community. That's part of what I'll be talking about today, so thank you. And thanks for um, deciding to spend this snowy day here with me. Uh, a college friend recently reminded me that when I was in school, snow days meant grabbing a tray from the cafeteria and sliding down our sunset hill, um, and which I think is, would be in Buchanan Park for you guys. So thanks for choosing to spend your free hour today here instead of out in the snow. For those of you fortunate enough to have been in the audience this same time last week, you probably heard the brilliant Marsha Chatelain talk about what it means to be an activist. And so I hope today will feel like a natural continuation of that conversation. At one point, Professor Chatelain also talked about the meaning of place, saying, our homes are not just where we rest or sleep, they're part of communities that teach us what is important. I'd like to open my time with you with exactly that thought. Everyone in this room came from somewhere. Each of you has a story about your home. My book, Welcome to Shirley, a memoir from an atomic town, is exactly that, a complicated love letter to the place where I first learned what is important. As Dr. Sher Sheridan said, um, Shirley is a small blue-collar town on the south shore of Long Island, a hard scrabble service town to the Tony or Hamptons, which you've probably heard of, just a few exits east. What most folks from there didn't know is the story of another neighbor just north of us, smack in the middle of the island, the Brookhaven National Laboratory, a federal nuclear facility. This uncomfortable triangle of privilege, working class shame, and organizational arrogance made for a potent powder keg, one that exploded in the late 1980s and early 1990s when I was in high school and the lab was named to the Federal Superfund list of the nation's worst polluters. My book is full of homegrown activists who saw something wrong and chose to fight for what they felt was right. There's Richard Lippis, an environmental lawyer who handled Love Canal and represents a class action lawsuit against the lab involving many of the families from Shirley. There's Randy Snell, a father and a local bank manager who became the voice of a childhood cancer cluster surrounding the lab when his three-year-old daughter, Lauren, was diagnosed. And there was Diane Sackett Nannery, a postal worker who played a huge part in establishing the pink ribbon stamps we probably all use to mail letters, even now, 10 years after she died of breast cancer. My activism was different, though. I didn't organize or protest or circulate petitions. Well, I've actually done a lot of that in my life, but not for this book. Um, instead, I saw an untold story, and I told it. Speaking into silence is another kind of activism. Correcting the record and including voices that other people say don't matter. Now, this book doesn't speak for the town as a whole. Instead, it is my attempt to tell a story about legacy and how the decisions we make based on survival today, what we put in the earth, what we put in our bodies, what we put in our hearts, follow us into our families and our homes. The ability to helix science and geology to a personal story is the beauty and power of memoir. I like to joke to my students that I am their ambassador for creative nonfiction. But what I don't often tell them is the reason I feel so strongly about the genre. Quite honestly, it saved me. I didn't just rewrite the story of a town. I rewrote the story of my home. I reclaimed something that despite being told was less than and disposable, I knew to be a source of beauty and strength. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity, as probably a few of you did, to see Anne Lamott speak over at Lancaster Bible College. And she talked about the power of two simple words, me too. Her talk was about building community, about finding human connection. 
This is the heart of creative nonfiction writing. When you come from a broken place in our society, you are told over and over by the government, by the media, sometimes even by those who love you, that you are worthless. I wanted to rewrite the official account because the official account didn't include the voices of the people I loved. I can't tell you what to think about nuclear energy, or politics, or the environment, and I wouldn't want to. But as a nonfiction writer, I can show you my experience and leave space for you on the page to walk next to me for a while. Through writing, we can create community. Through writing, we can say, me too. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the book, directly from the book, um, which might be a little different than the usual common hour, but hopefully you'll um, walk with me on the page for a little bit, and I will um, save some time at the end for questions. And I also wanted to say that the uh, the movie, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the book today, but there was a film, a documentary based on the book, inspired by the book, a launching pad, uh, The Atomic States of America, and I just heard uh, that the Wilson Center is going to be including it in their environmental film series this semester, so hopefully we'll get a chance to see that um, if you're interested. <clears throat> Across most of the town of Shirley in 1981, houses lined the haphazardly angled streets, packed together like points on a picket fence. Homes on my street were spaced about a car's width apart, maybe two. The majority of them held families with two or three children, and possibly a grandparent as well. From our last place in the Catskills, I couldn't even see another house. Here, everyone seemed to know everything about everyone else. A steady stream of women from the neighborhood shuffled up our driveway when we first moved in to knock on our front door. Each one brought food covered in tinfoil and stories about our landlady, Mrs. Kutch. Most of the women had been living on the block for years, and many had grown up in town. They did not wear aprons or trade suggestions for getting stains out of lace curtains. Instead, many of them wore blue eyeshadow, had gold chains with little charms of gold horns hanging from their necks, and they chain smoked. They brought meat-filled lasagna and rice balls and told my mother where not to buy her cold cuts. Many women also had daughters trailing shyly behind them. That summer in Shirley was the first time I was a part of a group in a neighborhood. I loved the freedom of opening the door to someone else's house and being able to wander in and out, looking in their refrigerator or their cupboards. Because I was an only child, some of the other mothers pitied me using this as a reason to baby me more than the other kids. But after we moved to Shirley, I never again wished for brothers and sisters. Anytime I wanted to be part of a larger family, I just walked out the front door and picked a direction. There were some differences between my family and the rest of the neighborhood. We weren't Catholic, we weren't Italian, and neither of my parents had grown up in the town, like the majority of our neighbors. And that made our absorption into the fabric of the neighborhood a touch trickier. It was our neighbor Jerry's friendship that eventually cemented my parents' place within the group. All the families on the block adored Jerry. And just as his daughter Tina was the natural leader of our group, the adults often turned to him about problems or decisions they faced. Both men often worked seven days a week, my father at the golf course and Jerry at the Brookhaven Laboratory, and then in the Hamptons as a weather stripper on weekends. So they must have first met late in the day, after work but before the summer sun had started to climb down its ladder. One of them was planting some flowers by their mailbox, and the other crossed the road and introduced himself. They liked each other immediately. They talked about plants and flowers, a favorite hobby for both men. Jerry had dark brown eyes and dark hair like my father, but his was straight instead of curly, and he kept it cropped short. Both men perpetually had what in my house was called a golfer's tan from working outside most seasons. While my father spent his days at Hampton Hills Country Club fixing members' slices at the outdoor jam driving range, 
Jerry cleaned up spills, buried carcasses of dead lab animals, and dumped chemicals into big diesel trucks and boxcars. He didn't enjoy his job, but unlike most of the other fathers, Jerry had a strong benefits package, since the lab was owned by the Department of Energy. He liked his benefits, but during late night games of gin rummy in our backyard, Jerry told my father he wanted to leave the Brookhaven laboratory because he was nervous about the chemicals he handled. In 1979, just two years earlier, the nuclear reactor on Three Mile Island had suffered a partial core meltdown. And since then, Jerry would never let his wife or kids touch him when he got home until after he showered. If we were playing out in the street when his truck pulled into the driveway, he would hold us back by our forehead, shouting that at work he'd been green slimed, a term from a popular Nickelodeon television show at the time, and had to wash up. So he was saving money from his weekend construction jobs, and he hoped to start his own weather stripping business. Jerry just needed a little more time, and he would have enough money to quit his job. My father, whose jobs rarely came with health insurance or any other health or retirement benefits, could sympathize with Jerry's wish to work for himself. But he also understood the draw of security and stability, two things he could never quite manage to hold on to. By mid-June, the girls started talking about the 4th of July. From the stories the four of them told me, it was the favorite neighborhood holiday. The families had a tradition of blocking off the street with sawhorses and other barriers dragged out of their garages, clearing away the day, clearing the way for a day-long block party. <clears throat> that morning, husbands and wives scuttled card tables, picnic tables, and even folding TV trays down their driveways to the street. By 11 a.m., the women brought out the first shift of food, steam curling through tinfoil. The adults dragged folding chairs up and down the block as they visited one another, lighting each other's cigarettes and topping off drinks from thermoses decorated with flower patterns. The whole block smelled of hot dogs. But the best thing about Fourth of July, and the part that I heard about when the girls started talking it up a few weeks before, was that while the adults ate and chatted, the kids had free reign over all the backyards on the block for an entire afternoon. We spent hours going to the key backyards that had swing sets, lobbing our bodies as high as we could before jumping off, and then we headed to the special one that had an in-ground pool. Our favorite game was mermaids, and the wiggle movement had to start in the head and end in the feet, ripple after ripple. We imagined green iridescent tails, long tendrils of hair flowing behind us, underwater gardens of exotic flowers, Never mind that we were squat or scrawny, bee stung, mosquito bitten, awkward with knotty hair. In the water, we became beautiful. The 4th of July also happened to be Jerry's birthday. The entire neighborhood gathered at sundown for his birthday cake, singing to him as he pretended to be surprised. The girls and I still in our soggy, chlorinated bathing suits. The adults who had not already retired for a nap after too much sun and booze ate cake and Maria brewed endless cups of coffee until the night turned navy blue. As the scrubby tops of the pitch pines pierced the darkening blanket of sky overhead, the neighborhood congregated at our end of the block, standing between our house and Jerry's as the men prepared the fireworks with the wildlife refuge as a backdrop. Joe had relatives in Brooklyn and Queens who always came out the week before the holiday with car trunks full of M80s and jumping jacks. Only the men were allowed to set the fireworks off, pulling lighters from back pockets to, lick, to light the wicks sticking out of coffee cans and pails of sand. One after another, the flares would be sent up into the night and explode with color so blinding I could still see it, even when I shut my eyes. There was a charge in the air with the men together, moving a bit sloppily after a day of drinking, and the wives or mothers calling out warnings in cautious tones every few minutes. For much of the evening, the girls and I danced around with our own sparklers, writing our names against the inky canvas at night. When those were gone, we simply watched wide-eyed, clapping with each colorful explosion or shrieking over the seismic booms of the M80s until, full of cake and exhausted after swimming all day, we let our heads loll back against a cushion of grass. After the last firework was set off and the rickety tables had been dragged back up the driveways, 
Our fathers scooped our limp bodies off the ground and slung us over their sulfur-scented shoulders, laying us on our beds on top of the covers and sheets, the muffled sounds of distant fireworks bursting into our dreams. After the 4th of July, the rest of the summer days were still spent traipsing through the refuge or hopping through sprinklers. By early August, the girls and I were gathering on the uneven street in front of our houses almost every evening, where the sharp tang of barbecue mingled with the sweeter scents of chlorine from our hair and sweat from our bodies. At that hour, televisions hadn't been turned on for the night yet, and neither had porch lights. We relaxed under the unfolding arms of the oaks and pines that reached toward each other from the opposite sides of the street. We traded stories and jokes, listening to the sounds traveling freely between the small, tightly packed homes, the murmur of after-dinner conversation, the rhythmic beating of a box fan lazily circulating the cooling air, the soft clink of dishes being washed under an open window. After dinner on these summer nights, the girls and I would mill around in the middle of the block, waiting for Jerry. Once he joined us, we would fan out on the ground so our feet pointed into the middle of a circle. Lying down with our hands behind our heads to cushion us, we made a brightly colored pinwheel of shorts and tank tops against the gravel. Jerry, tanned brown and tidy in his neighborhood uniform of jeans and a t-shirt, smelled freshly scrubbed from his daily post-work shower. He would ask us about our day and laugh at our jokes until, just as the clouds turned from pink to violet, our chatter grew hushed and we all stared into the sky. At first, the dark shapes looked like the dry sheets of leaves caught up in the wind, or sparrows darting drunk. Soon, the solitary forms would turn into threads of twenty, and then sheets of hundreds as the bats flew out of their secret homes in the cool recesses of the wildlife refuge for the freedom of the night. Jerry shouted out numbers with us as we tried to count them, attempting to force order onto the flitting mass. Their screams echoed against bedroom windows, mailboxes, bikes propped against cement stoops, and other ordinary things from our daylit lives, seeping into them, claiming the objects. When we could no longer keep track of the bats, we would shriek, overwhelmed, imagining that the creatures were swooping down on our circle, hard little bodies taking over our world. Though the ritual felt much longer, the flight of the bats probably only lasted about 10 minutes. Slowly, as the night grew darker and the outlines of the packs of winged animals melted into the black of the sky, the street lamps would blink on, turning our bedroom windows, mailboxes, and bikes back into the objects we knew. Finished with the dishes, our mothers would lean out of windows and doors and begin calling us home one by one. So Jerry would become incredibly important to our lives. Two years after we moved to Shirley, we were living in a rental. Our landlady needed the house back. Her daughter was moving in. There happened to be a house for sale around the corner, and we desperately wanted to stay, but we didn't have the down payment. And this is the 80s, and it was pretty impossible to get any money from a bank in that, and with high interest rates. Now, of course, Jerry had been saving for years for his weather stripping business idea, but he put that on hold, and he loaned us his life savings instead. My dad paid him back with interest, and we were able to remain in the neighborhood we quickly grown to love. But what none of us understood was the danger lurking just on the other side of town in the form of the Brookhaven lab. While I was growing up, the lab was a fixture of my imagination, as it was for the other kids in the neighborhood. Much like the proverbial monster in the basement, the lab obsessed us precisely because it was so close and yet we had no access. We couldn't see the buildings or the scientists who populated them. The majority of the scientists lived on the North Shore or west of the laboratory, not in Blue Collar Shirley. The neighborhood fathers, like Jerry, another one Andrew, who spent their days there, refused to talk much about what their jobs actually entailed or what kind of work went on at the lab. Lacking any real knowledge, we created our own version of the Brookhaven lab. In my mind, the lab's buildings were made of a transparent igloo-like substance, and the rooms inside were full of metallic file cabinets and notebooks full of secret codes. Men and women in crisp white lab coats and plastic goggles coaxed new species of frogs and lizards out of mottled purple eggs. 
Others hovered over milky glass globes of light whose kinked antennae sparked blue shots of electricity into the dim, silent air. And the lab-coated scientists ate crayon-colored pills for lunch that tasted like chicken cutlets and chocolate cake. After Jerry's cancer, my imaginary lab became a much darker place, a small, sinister pocket hiding in the pines. A report on community relations prepared in September 1991 for the Brookhaven Lab by ICF Kaiser engineers notes that a number of BNL employees felt that the lab administration needs to increase the attention it gives to employee health and safety. The report says that the employees were particularly concerned with low-level radiation exposure, resulting both from their direct work at the lab and simply from working on the lab property. On a page discussing contaminated groundwater and public concern over long-term effects of exposure to past leaks at the lab of trichloroethylene, tritium, and radiation in general, the report says, Brookhaven National Lab employees concerned over work-related exposure related that when they questioned the risks of certain activities, they were told by their supervisors that, quote, a little radiation won't hurt you. Jackie and my father took turns driving Jerry to chemotherapy. They would help him to the car, the young man turned old, his gait unrecognizable. His favorite shirt, red with a bubblegum machine on the chest, swallowed his frame, billowing out like a sail on a boat. Hours later, the car would pull back into the driveway. We would stop our games on the street corner and watch as my father draped Jerry's arm and shoulder and guided him up the steps of the deck Jerry had built with his own hands into the cool darkness of his home. My father is not a big man. The muscles in his arms and legs are long instead of bulky. He has the shape of a runner rather than a bodybuilder. But he made Jerry look like a child on those afternoons. The winter was cold and quiet. No one ever banged the screen door at Jerry's house anymore or rang the doorbell after dinner. As spring lights started to peek through the blinds of the living room, however, there was a hopeful turn. The tumors in his brain were shrinking. The neighborhood seemed to exhale in unison. We screamed louder during our games of softball in the corner, laughed more easily. My father was relieved, hopeful that his friend's suffering would be over soon. My mother was more wary. He still has a long way to go, she cautioned. But my father and I just figured we knew Jerry better than she did. Everyone in the neighborhood wanted to believe that he was almost through. The women kept cooking, taking turns every week, dropping off food or plates of cookies to help take some pressure off his wife, Jackie. Everyone looked forward to the time when Jerry would be back on his feet. And with summer and the 4th of July getting closer, there seemed to be an unspoken deadline for recovery. The brain cancer was in remission, but had metastasized into his lungs through a complicated rope ladder of knotty lymph nodes. As Jerry grew sicker and the drugs that the doctors gave him to ease his pain became less and less effective, my father focused on alternative therapies. The men spent hours working on meditation and visualization. They breathed in unison, deep breaths in and out, counting backward and forward, imagining a cloud of relaxation moving up their bodies from their feet to their skulls. My father took books and tapes out of the library, learning how to lead Jerry to an imagined beach or field of flowers. You can imagine two kind of hard-working guys <laughs> together in a town like this, doing that together. It's um, one of the most beautiful things I can imagine. A few times in the middle of their sessions, Jerry talked about how he thought he got cancer. He smoked, of course, but he was so young. And in these quiet moments, he confessed to my father that he suspected it was the work he did at the lab that had made him sick. He handled waste materials and had worried about some of the situations he put himself in. He may have been the last one on the block to verbalize this idea. From what I could tell, the rest of the neighborhood already assumed the same. Everyone knew that Jerry's favorite joke was that he could glow in the dark. No one made that joke anymore. On his 43rd birthday, Jerry sat in a plastic chair at the end of his driveway. The chemo didn't seem to be affecting the other tumors, and the cancer in his brain had returned. Jerry did his best to enjoy the July 4th holiday and block party, 
but he had to return exhausted to his house before the customary cutting of the cake. The large sheet of vanilla and fudge sat on the rickety card table for most of the night. That summer was charged with a feeling of inevitability. I had never known anybody who died, but by then I had the feeling that I couldn't stop whatever it was that was coming. By the end of the summer, both my father and I had accepted what my mother already knew. We couldn't stop what was on its way. The first nuclear reactor eventually built on the Camp Upton site was called the Brookhaven Graphite Research Reactor. During the years the reactor was constructed, between 1947 and 1950, the country's nuclear program was still top secret, shrouded in Cold War concealment. Built for research rather than to produce power, the reactor was the first of its kind to be constructed for peaceful purposes. The scientists applying for opportunities to use the reactor would be conducting experiments designed to further science, rather than simply bulking up the national atomic we weaponry cache. A 30-foot steel partition walled off the reactor's western face, preserving access for only those scientists who had been cleared by the federal government for experiments relating to national security and defense. In 1955, two years after President Eisenhower's 1953 Adams for Peace speech, in which the identity and work of many of the country's atomic labs and experiments were revealed for the first time, the Brookhaven National Laboratory was officially declassified to reflect this new era of openness, the 30-foot steel partition was ceremoniously propped open. For the general public, though, little changed, and the compound remained clandestine and off-limits. Hardly any information about the nature of the lab's work or the machines housed there ever passed beyond the military-style gates. By the time the first houses in Shirley were finished in the 1950s, their curtains hung and trim painted, the lab's first nuclear reactor was already humming away behind the tall barricade of pine tops. The Brookhaven Graphite Research Reactor only lasted about a decade. In 1960, nuclear waste from the reactor was accidentally pumped into a drinking water well instead of the fill pipe of an underground holding tank. During some experiments to produce neutrons, the reactor also leaked radioactive slurry into the soil and groundwater. Aging and unreliable, the reactor was shut down in 1968. Leftover radioactive material was sealed in the reactor's boxy building. Seventy layers of contaminated graphite blocks are contained in a cube measuring 25 feet on each side. It would take 300,000 years for the radioactive material to reach levels safe enough for human interaction. That's longer than Long Island itself has existed. In 1960, meanwhile, Shirley was the fastest growing community in Suffolk County. The town was exploding. While the Brookhaven Graphite Research Reactor was shutting down, masses of Italian immigrants from the city, coaxed by the ads in Italian newspapers and broadcast over Italian radio shows, were flooding into town, so that the year-round population of Shirley more than doubled in the short span of 10 years. The Brookhaven Project could have been stopped. The Atomic Energy Commission and the scientists themselves could have taken a look around and realized they were no longer on their own in the middle of wilderness. A few hundred feet beyond the 5,000-acre compound, newly arrived families were raking leaves, washing cars, tending vegetable gardens. Once the Brookhaven, Brookhaven Graphite Research Reactor had cracked open and leaked, and once the reactor had been decommissioned, the program officials could have looked back at their founding documents and reminded themselves that they were originally intended to operate at least 10 miles away from any populous area. They could have packed up, or they could have recognized that the homes and neighborhoods sprouting up around their compound were too close to chance the radioactive nature of the work they were conducting and continued with only the non-nuclear experiments. But none of this happened. Instead, the high-flux beam reactor came online in 1965. Unlike the boxy design of the Brookhaven Graphite Research Reactor, the high-flux beam reactor was housed in a large dome, smooth and concave like a forehead. The new reactor was built right next to the old one, and their slender red and white striped chimney stacks pointed into the air like twin fingers. The Peconic 
River flows into Flanders Bay, which is the body of water between the island's north and south forks. The headwaters of the Baconic River are located in the northern portion of the Brookhaven National Lab site in the vicinity of their sewage treatment plant. Two other rivers originate within the aquifer beneath the Long Island Pine Barrens, the Forge River, which is Shirley's eastern boundary, and the Carmen's River, which is the town's western boundary, and flows through the wildlife refuge that bordered my neighborhood. Both rivers discharge into the Great South Bay on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Along with these rivers, the Pine Barrens is also home to a recharge basin that serves Long Island's sole source aquifer. The aquifer supplies more than three million people with drinking water. The Brookhaven National Laboratory, with its graphite reactor, high flux beam reactor, and a third failed nuclear experiment called Project Isabel, all three of which leaked, sits in the middle of the Pine Barrens, right on top of this drinking water aquifer. So once I committed myself to this book, and I knew what I was writing, I knew I'd have to go to the lab itself, which terrified me. I'd gone once before. Uh, they have this series of summer Sundays meant for kids, so there's an ice cream truck in the parking lot, and you get a balloon, and um, it's a really fun, light day. But I felt like I went in under the radar that day. I was hiding. Um, I wanted to see what would happen if I went in as myself as a girl who grew up in Shirley and wanted answers. So that's what I did. <clears throat> At the old military style gate, the guard directed me to a nearby security trailer, and after smiling at a small camera connected to a computer and clipping a day pass to my shirt and a parking pass on my rear view mirror, I drove down another long stretch of road, the pitch pines still standing guard on either side. I squinted at the green and black LED greeting that blazed on the side of the main entrance to the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Science for the world, the sign announced cheerily. A moment later, this message sped off the screen and was replaced with the equally chipper, safety never hurts. I went on tours of the different machines and facilities and the grounds as well. One woman explained to me the groundbreaking discoveries they had made in addiction therapy and another told me about studies conducted on, conducted on breast cancer in astronauts, the result of exposure of radiation in space. On one tour, we passed the gamma forest, the result of exposure to the, sorry, the gamma forest, where between 1961 and 79, scientists bombarded almost 200 acres with cesium-137 in an attempt to discover how vegetation would react in the event Russia dropped a nuclear bomb on us. The trees are still dead in a bullseye pattern surrounding the spot where they had left the cesium out in the open. Later during that same tour, I walked through the quiet of the pines and a man showed me foxholes, left over from the Camp Upton days. They're some of the only remaining trenches still intact in the country today. I was taken on tours of the Highfield MRI facility, the positron emission tomography facility, the National Synchrotron Light Source Accelerator. I was told about incredible studies in unparalleled science, about heavy ion colliders, particle acceleration, and nanomaterials. But I still hadn't found the information I was looking for. So I tried another way. Over a turkey and cheese sandwich and a side of chips, compliment of my escort, I had listened to the U.S. Department of Energy's press manager speak with welcome candor about the lab's failings to communicate with local communities, particularly Shirley, over the past few decades. His open and relaxed manner and a small gold hoop in his left ear were as much a relief as his admission of imperfection on the lab's part, the first I'd heard following a string of very defensive interviews. Immediately after he left our small table in the Berkner Hall cafeteria, however, my hostess had made it clear that none of what he said or anyone else had said that day was to be considered on the record. It was the first unfriendly moment between us, and I prepared myself for another as I asked her to explain what she meant. I don't understand why you want to rehash all the pollution issues when they've already been the subject of newspaper articles. Why do you want to bring all that up again? Her eyes narrowed. 
Well, I began, I'm interested in telling the story from Shirley's point of view. I'm interested not just in the lab itself, but in the way the relationship between the lab and Shirley has impacted the town. She smiled a small, tight smile. But there is no relationship between Shirley and the lab. I paused. But John had just finished describing how one of his hardest days at the lab was the community meeting about the tritium leak. I reminded her. He said more than 600 residents who learned about the contamination and water hookups over the radio showed up screaming and crying out of fear for their families. Many of those weren't even in Shirley, she said. We really have no connection to the town at all. In fact, 640 out of the 800 affected homes were in Shirley. Well, I should get going if I want to make my next meeting, she said, rising abruptly from her chair. Like most of my tour guides that day, she struck me as a fundamentally decent person who'd probably like to do the right thing. I was frustrated that I was unable to make her understand that talking about the legacy of pollution at the Brookhaven National Lab was a way of protecting her own family and all families living near polluted sites across the country, not just the people of Shirley. I thought of all the machines I had toured in the past few days of all the brilliant minds hard at work there, all the brilliant minds whirring away just within the domed walls of the cafeteria itself. I looked past my host and spotted a table where some of the kitchen staff sat taking a break, slouching in their uniforms, eating lunch and drinking sodas, talking about their weekend. I wondered what they thought about all the experiments going, around them, going on around them every day. I stared at my host and then again passed her shoulder at the tired, smiling faces of the kitchen staff. Did they care how the universe might have looked in the first few moments of creation? Did they care about quantum chromodynamics and nanoscience? Were their lives less valuable if they did not? I walked out of Berkner Hall with my escort into the chill of a January afternoon. We said our goodbyes, and I walked to the parking lot a few buildings down to my car, the slender tips of the reactor smokestacks visible above the tree line. I drove past the chestnut trees, dropping their spiny clusters, past the gaggles of geese that clotted the lawns of the different buildings, past the hotel-style dormitories for visiting scientists, past the spider-legged water towers, past the blinking LED sign announcing safety never hurts, and past the guard booth. I turned left, and within five minutes and two traffic lights, I was home again in Shirley. Thank you. Kelly, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to let everyone know that the Writer's House also, I meant to say this before, the Writer's House would be delighted to buy each of you a copy of Kelly's book, which is available now as an e-book mm -hmm. from Amazon. Yeah. And so if you would like a copy, <laughs> uh, you'll end up being able to read it on your computer, even right. if you don't have a Kindle. Um, please sign up with Joanna Underhill at the door Great. back there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey. Hi, Professor McMasters. How Hi. are you? Good, Tyler. Um, <laughs> so my question for you is a two-part question. Okay. First part is, when did you know that you were going to write this book? Mm. <clears throat> and two, when did you start writing it? And did you include parts that you wrote before you even planned on writing the book? That's a great question. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I started writing it before I knew I was writing it. So I went to, um, well, first I should say I didn't always think, I'm going to be a writer. Um, that was, uh, well, and as anyone who grows up in a kind of blue-collar town, you know, I looked around and said, well, I know what the problem is. I know why everybody is struggling. Nobody's wearing a suit to work. So I'm going to wear a suit to work. That's what I'm going to do. And so I decided I was going to law school and was going to um, uh, just power through that way. So I worked in a law firm after college for a little bit and realized that was absolutely the wrong place uh, for me, and I went into journalism after that. 
And so after a few years of working in magazines, I went to grad school. And when I was in grad school, I just started writing these essays that kept returning to the town. And I didn't understand why. But there was something happening there that, um, that I was trying to work out in my mind. And I think looking back, it was that disconnect of this place that I loved so deeply and cared about so much that I was ashamed to say I was from. Um, if you're from my town, often you say, oh, I'm from the East End, or, oh, I live near Mariches. You don't say, I'm from Shirley, because you get the same reaction pretty much every time. Oh. <laughs> um, and so I think I was writing to understand that complexity. And then after I put a few essays together, uh, one of my mentors and professors, Richard Locke, sat me down and said, you realize there's a big haunted house on the hill in the middle of all this. And it was the lab. He said, you have to look directly at that. Because um, that was present sort of on the outskirts of all the essays. So after I realized what I was tracking, I understood the larger story. And then I started to talk about it as a book. But, um, but it still, working in isolation, even after having a contract, after thinking, OK, this, is, this really is going to be a book, I still didn't quite understand what I was doing. And I remember a few weeks before the book came out, um, Richard Locke again said, so you realize you're taking on the federal government. <laughs> I said, oh my god, you're right. Um, so I'm glad that I didn't make certain realizations um, until later on, until it was too late. Uh, and I also remember very clearly taking a reporter from Newsday through the town a few weeks before the book came out and having the sense of, what if this is the last time I'm allowed here? What if they read it and they're mad and angry and never want me to come back here and, this is, and I've just basically kicked myself out of the home that I wrote this love letter to? Luckily, um, I did receive hundreds and hundreds of emails and letters from people in Shirley, and what mostly they said was, thank you for seeing us. I mean, there's nothing whitewashed. Like, I, I, Shirley is a difficult place. There are complicated things happening in that town, um, and the people are complicated. So I told the truth, but they recognized it as the truth, and they appreciated it for that. Does that answer? Yep. Thank you. You know, given your personal experience, memoir seems an obvious choice of genre, but mm -hmm. if you had not done it in memoir, do you have any thoughts about a different essay form and how it would have affected it? So when I first um, wrote, for nonfiction, you generally sell a book on a proposal. And so I had a few chapters and a proposal outlining what I thought the book would feel like. And when we first went out to about six publishers, Three came back and said, you know, I really like the journalism. I really like how you dug in and did your research and all the science is great. The memoir stuff, meh. How about you just go with the journalism and we'll do it, you know, like a um, kind of like a murder mystery. Um, and then the other three said, you know, we love the memoir. We love the town. We love the characters. But the science, I don't know. We didn't really like the science. So we had, my agent and I had to pull back and think, well, what does this mean? Do I make a choice? Or do I figure out a different way to combine them? And um, I did work hard on integrating history, science, and memoir, kind of combining those into one thing. Um, and for me, it was important because I feel like I couldn't reach the readers. If, if, if it was just a memoir, it would feel like I wasn't telling the whole story. If it was just journalism, I would feel like I wasn't telling the whole story. So for me, I knew I, I needed to do the book the way I was going to do it. Um, I have a journalist background, so I write a lot of, you know, where there's no eye on the page. I'm also an essayist, so I write a lot of personal essays, but they're, my goal is always to expand and that it's not about me. Just like this book is not about me, it's about the town. I'm just the vehicle moving through the town. 
So I think memoir in general often gets a bad rap because um, a lot of what you see extolled is, is that sort of navel-gazing, uh, me, me, me. If you research and look at the history of the genre, it's not actually uh, meant to be that. And in my classes, we talk about the difference between a journal entry and a memoir, and there are big differences. Um, I think the documentary was an interesting change of form for me. And I think aside from this mixture, the documentary got to a similar place. And I'm not a film person. I learned so much through, in ways of how to see, in ways of how to construct narrative. Um, but I think the documentary form is another place where you can build in history, um, the past, the future, the mix of all those things, and still be real, and still tell a true story. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so last week in class, we were talking about how uh, all of our lives can be boiled down into one <laughs> sentence. Oh, no. Are you going to um, turn my lecture yeah. on me? <laughs> <laughs> So I was curious if uh, Shirley or environmentalism are involved in your one sentence, um, and if not, what would that one sentence be if it's not uh, wrapped up in those two things? You're too smart for me, Karen. <laughs> That's a great question, and you're right. I do ask my students to think about their voice, their focus, what have they come to the page to say. And looking back at my writing, um, I do consider myself, I'm not sure if naturalist is the right fit, but I consider myself a landscape writer. There's always a tension to that, uh, in, in, mm, that space between, that interaction between humans and the land, that we, because there's history going both ways, right? And I find that fascinating. Um, but I would say most of my stories can actually be boiled down to one word, not even a sentence. So now you have to do that. Um, survival. I didn't realize I was writing a book about survival, but ultimately, to flip it to a question, what kind of choices do we make to survive? For family, morality, um, environment, and it sort of covers all bases. But I'm interested in that complicated knot of the choices we make based on survival. Um, and it doesn't have to mean, you know, the, the very dramatic getting enough food to eat survival. I mean our civilized, um, am I a good person survival. How can I move through this world and retain the sense of who I am, what I believe in, and still face and exist in the world every day? Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. I have two questions. Um, one is, if you think you would have been able to write this book if you had been born and uh, raised in Shirley from, you know, mm -hmm. from birth, uh, yeah. if that would have affected your perspective or, or how you wrote the book. And also, I'm curious if you had any, in the process of writing about your, your own memories or personal details, were, did you have any touchstones that you turned to in terms of, you know, talking to relatives or Mm -hmm. um, you know, mementos that helped you kindle those memories. I've never had that question before. Would I be able to write it if I was from the town, if I was born there? I don't think so. I think, you know, we, my family had bounced around and um, we were mostly, you know, in places for six months or so to a year before getting to Shirley. And so, the impression that the, um, it meant so much to me to have a home and to have experience of bouncing around and having my home be tied to two people and then suddenly having a physical um, and landscape-based version of that home um, made such an impression on me as a child that it colored everything that came after it. And so I think I felt fiercer, a fear, maybe a fiercer love when people would um, 
would, maybe it was easier for me to not feel ashamed because I, I saw other sides. And um, I also think not having been from the town, I was always a little bit of an outsider. And that also made reporting a little, in a, in a strange way, a little bit easier because I saw these people as family and I think they saw me as family, but, um, but I still was just a little bit on the outside. And I only really understood what Shirley meant to me once I did get outside, once I went away to college. And I sat and listened to um, people, you know, complaining about their families and complaining about their home. And I loved both of those things. And I thought, if I love, if I can feel love for both of those things, then why do I not necessarily want to shout from the top of, you know, the building where I'm from? And, and that was the mix. Um, and then for the touchstones, I did have a lot of um, journals and photos and I mean I went back and a lot of the people that I write about live in the same homes and so I went back to, and sat in that street where we, where we used to watch bats. Um, you know these girls that I write about are still my best friends today and we were in each other's weddings and our kids play together and and so a lot of it is still alive. It's not necessarily the past for me. Um, and I could say, do you remember my birthday party? Was that pinata a donkey or a duck? And someone would dig up a picture. Um, and actually there's a picture, I would say this might be the, the main touchstone. There's a picture that opens the book from my um, birthday party as a kid. And it's, um, it's in front of our old house. That was my first, the house I loved the most. And I mean, I can still tell you the, you know, the pattern of the wallpaper in the bathroom. It was this crazy gold lame. It was so fancy to me. It was amazing and it belonged to us. Um, and there's this, you know, this rusty old mailbox and here are the kids and we are just your normal kids. And I just felt like if I could explain to those folks at the lab and say, this is who you're calling disposable. This is, you know, these people are, you are no better than these people. Um, I think reminding, any touchstone that reminded me of how absolutely normal um, we were was what was helpful. Thanks. Hi. Thank you for your reading. I have two questions sure. as well. Um, the first is, how did these experiences, either of writing the book or growing up in Shirley, mm -hmm. um, inform your activism? Mm -hmm. And the second is, what insight do you have to share with activists who are facing the invasion of their communities by harmful industries? By what industries? Harmful industries. Got it. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, like I said, I real I have been sort of a classic activist in the past of protesting and, and doing all those things. And I find um, such worth in those acts. And I do feel like this is different. And um, it's solitary, um, you know, the act of writing. It's, um, even though you, you put it out into the world, it's still, um, it feels somewhat quieter. And I think that's not something to discount. When I was making this list of activists and thinking about the activists that I admire, I want to introduce um, the idea of service also as activism, because I think the creation of community, what I was talking about earlier on, sharing of stories, I mean, I really mean it. If someone at the lab could look at the face of this child and think, oh, me too then that's activism, that's connecting. Um, in no words, the social justice group that I'm part of on campus, we uh, talk about, there was this great poet who came last semester, Andrea Gibson, and she said, you know, you can't change minds, so change hearts. And that really speaks to me. In our group, we think, we can't change what happened in Ferguson, but we can change F&M. So I think the idea sometimes is to think smaller. And um, 
I, last night it occurred to me, the person that, um, who I learned activism from is my mother, and she, I never saw her necessarily on, on, a, on a picket line or anything like that, but what I saw was, you know, when I was a child, she brought me to the food pantry every week. It was this little single wide trailer stuck in the back of the parking lot of the junior high school, and she made me bag food with her and stay and watch the families come and, you know, put the diapers in and things like that. That was my first introduction. I'd consider that service activism. In sixth grade, she started working in hospice. And I can't imagine a more pure version or example of activism than the work she did for decades in that small private space when someone's dying. And that's the most connected I think you can be to a human. And so even though I, I believe in these communities and, and groups doing things together, I think it's also one-on-one. -on -one. And I think, um, you know, we talk as writers, a lot of us are introverts. And it feels like, well, I can't be the one shouting at the front. You don't have to be. You can be the one talking to one person, changing one heart, writing your story and sharing that story with one person and changing their heart. Um, I mean, again, within this campus. So I think what I learned also after, you know, writing this book and being asked to be on panels and, um, you know, people would make assumptions. Oh, you're anti-nuclear. I'm actually not anti-nuclear. I'm anti-waste. Um, I think there are a whole lot of complicated questions you have to answer before you can even decide if you're pro or anti-nuclear. Um, but often what would happen is somebody from the other side would come at me and ask me a question, but they weren't going to listen. So that kind of debate, I feel, is often not fruitful. But storytelling, storytelling is human. We learn through story. That's how we relate. Um, so I, for me, and I think what Karen said, um, I do ask my students, what is your one sentence? You know, what is your one thing? We all have to find the, the best way for us to make change. It's not all going to be the same way.